You're heading south of the Mason-Dixon. This is the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute. Here is your host, Brian McClanahan. Welcome back to the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute. This is your host, Brian McClanahan. This is episode 57, covering the week of January 30th through February 3rd, 2017. Glad to have you back on the program. Again, a little housekeeping, uh, just a reminder uh, that we exist on your generous contributions alone. If you'd like to keep this podcast going, the website going, all those wonderful things that help us explore what is true and valuable in the Southern tradition, then please consider making a tax-deductible contribution to the Abbeville Institute. It will help keep the lights on. Also, like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, and like our YouTube page. Uh, we do put our conference videos on our YouTube page. Uh, and we do post regularly on Facebook and Twitter. And if you do like us there, make sure you share our material. That is the way we spread the word and how we keep our message of, uh, again, what is what is true and valuable in the Southern tradition. We're, we're really going to uh, try to start talking uh, in some ways, you know, honing in on that this year, and explain what we think the South offers 21st century America. Uh, what parts of the, of the South, what parts of the Southern tradition can apply to us today, and um, how can we uh, expand on those things, and how can we make those things a prominent part of American culture and society. Uh, so uh, please consider doing all those things, and um, you are going to help us in our mission to do that. Okay, so we've got a lot of stuff to talk about this week. In fact, uh, there was a general theme this week, and uh, it may not be apparent by looking at the articles that we ran, but um, it's essentially this. We talked about decentralization and the inability of incompatible things to be together. Uh, and that was always apparent in the early Federal Republic, which is why we had a decentralized model, a federalist model for the United States, because the founding generation recognized that we did have a union of what could be incompatible things if there was too much centralization. And I think that's what we're seeing now in America. We have, uh, uh, after the 2016 election, you've had the left now begin agitating for secession and decentralization because they recognize that uh, they don't necessarily want to be governed by someone that they consider um, to be alien to their interests and ideas. And when Barack Obama was president, you had the same thing from the right. Well, this is perfectly natural in a society in which we have a nationalist agenda from the top down. Every problem becomes a national problem, whether it's education or the environment or uh, you know, labor. Take your pick. Every problem is a national problem. But that's not the way that uh, the founding generation conceived of the union. It is a union of states, a federal republic that contains smaller federal republics. I mean, if you look at the states, um, there was an effort in many of the states to have a decentralized model there as well. Uh, but um, we have a, a federal union, not a national government. At least that's what it was designed to be. And now, of course, over the years, uh, particularly in the last 150 years, you've had much more centralization in the uh, general government. And that has created a, a, a crisis for a lot of people because, you know, if you're a, a leftist in California, you look at this current government and you say, my gosh, this government does not represent our interests and our ideas, and we want something different. Uh, and I can perfectly understand what they're saying. Uh, and when you looked at the eight years before this, you had people that were uh, conservative saying, this government is not representing my interests and my ideas, and I could perfectly understand that. So I think what needs to happen is we need to have a cultural change in America, an understanding that the states better represent their constituents, and that we need a high level of decentralization. If you want to, this is what the thing, this is something that Calhoun said over and over again. If you want to keep the union together, then you have to recognize that you cannot have a national government. Now, he never said it in those words. Calhoun always insisted he was a unionist. And you had, uh, we, we talked about, for example, a, a couple of weeks back, a few weeks back, Philip Pendleton Barber, who was a Supreme Court justice, who said the exact same thing. Look, uh, if you want to keep the union together, you have to maintain 
the original Constitution, which allowed for the general government to control foreign policy and our trade with foreign nations, but everything else was left to the states. If you want to keep the, if you want to keep this thing intact, if you try to start forcing your will of one section or one state on the others, well, then you're going to start running into problems. Or nowadays, if you want to start enforcing your will of your political ideology on half the population who doesn't want it, you're going to start running into problems. There's going to be unrest. And so if you look at the first piece of the week by Clyde Wilson, Cal Exit, California, adios, he essentially brings us up. Uh, and he says um, that uh, essentially if California wants to go, we should let them. And of course, he brings up the positive aspects of this. Uh, that this would um, perhaps be better for California and better for the rest of the United States, for California to get out. Uh, because the people of California, I mean, they recognize that there's, it's, a, it's as any viable as any uh, nationhood uh, in other places of the world, Latin America, Europe, wherever. Uh, he, he recognizes, though, that there are people in California who may not want to leave the Union, and so maybe some effort should be made to try to relocate those people in the United States and let California go. Uh, he does recognize there could be problems if California leaves. He says California independence can bring with it some real problems. For instance, as it collapses ever further into debt-ridden poverty, the government may try to prevent good Americans from leaving, as is the case now with uh, people in southern Africa. He says parasites need their hosts. Another genuine concern is that the vacuum will bring in dangerous Chinese influence. Response will have to be made to such uh, situations when they arise. Decisions will be much easier without California distorting the national debate. <clears throat> so, um, it's, it's important to note that this idea of decentralization uh, is really the, the idea of the 21st century. He also, you know, one thing that, that Clyde does in this piece is he talks about uh, how the, the common argument against secession is that, well, not everyone in the state would want it, or there's people that were held captive in the state. He brings up the South uh, during the War for Southern Independence, and he says, you know, uh, there, were, there were slaves in the South, and so they had no voice. Uh, So uh, this, this, he says, is just, you know, when you look at what happened in 1860, there are actually more slaves uh, in uh, the North or the Union. Uh, when you have uh, the first wave of secession, there were more slaves in, say, Virginia, North Carolina, uh, and you add in the other slave states and had actually left with uh, the Deep South. So he says this historical ignorance is a problem. Um, and he says, if I have a right to secession, then that right cannot be subject to the interference of some force that claims to reject my right on his own self-determined moral considerations. That is simply to say that there is no right and there cannot be and never can be any right. Its exercise will always be countered by some outside evaluation of its bad motives. The South declared honestly that it succeeded to be free of exploitation and interference. Its independence could not be justly challenged by an opponent's propaganda slogan that was motivated by the evil motive of keeping slavery. In fact, the North had never challenged slavery, only opposed its extension into new territory. Which is true. So he's, he's not just saying that um, you know, secession is, is uh, viable for California. He's saying that you cannot challenge their motives because you are talking about self-determination, and everyone can challenge someone else's motives. You could say, well, you know, Californians don't have a viable reason to secede, looking from the outside, but they do, because if you start doing this, you have no right to do anything. If I say I have a right to free speech to say whatever I want, well, if what I'm saying 
is not uh, does not uh, work with what you believe, then you can say, I don't have a right to have that, that free speech. And this is essentially what happens with political correctness. Uh, people will say, well, I don't like what you're saying, so you can't say it, so I'm going to exercise my right of free speech to keep you from saying what you what you want to say. This is what happened in California just a few days ago with all the riots uh, at Berkeley over uh, Milo's uh, discussion of political correctness on college camp- on college campuses. So uh, they're, ex- quote unquote, this is what they said, they're exercising the right of free speech to keep somebody from speaking. Well, that's just hypocrisy at its best, but of course that's what the North does. And that's what we also talked about in this particular uh, week because uh, one of the things you have, and when you look at, again, incompatible things, is that uh, this Yankee mentality is not just in the North, it also penetrated the South and uh, this idea, this very imperialistic, aggressive idea that you have to essentially do what I say, um, that is that is Yankeeism. And of course, the South, the South was not immune to it. We have a piece on Thursday entitled The Southern Yankee. So the piece on, on uh, Tuesday, Never the North, Always the South, by Paul Yarbrough, gets into this. You know, he talks about Tom Price's confirmations, uh, confirmation hearings in the Senate, and um, he was asked a question by uh, Tim Kaine, who is not from Virginia, really. He's from the North. He's from Minnesota. And um, Kane said I, uh, something about, uh, Pri- uh, Kane asked a price about slavery, and, and um, uh, Price came up with the standard response, well, I think slavery is an abomination, and uh, this was an irrelevant question. Why is it that uh, this even had to be brought up in 2017? Why is it these smug people have to ask these questions? Well, that's because these smug people from the North believe that the only thing they can do is hammer people over the head with race and slavery from the South, as if they don't have any skeletons in their own closet, and the North was completely immune from any of these problems. As if Abraham Lincoln had freed any slaves, he didn't. And so, uh, uh, Yarborough brings up, he says, the sadness, aside from the fact that it's simply not true, is that these untutored, untaught, or perhaps just dishonest men discharged as vomitous leaving Southerners, historically the most patriotic lovers of freedom and Republican government, as men who cannot be responsible alone for what they did not singularly do. And did, in fact, led by the greatest of Southern states, Virginia, try to outlaw long before there was even a celebratory July 4th. He reminds the reader that Jefferson tried to ban the slave trade. And he says the history of slavery covered every continent and virtually every region and state of the world, but the entire history of slavery in the Western Hemisphere, no, the entire history of slavery itself, for some reason, seems to fall upon the American South. This is ahistorical. More slaves landed in Brazil and the Spanish West Indies and the British West Indies and the French West Indies than the South. 2,000% more, in fact. The first slave ship was a Massachusetts owned ship. So, why aren't these Northerners going into these confirmation hearings and say, uh, do you denounce the slave trade? Because, uh, you know, your, your people participated in this. Well, of course, nobody does that. But for some reason, the South is always pegged as this uh, insignificant other, and everyone has to get in front of somebody and say, I, I denounce this. Why? Is anybody in the, in the United States uh, that has any credibility advocating the, uh, the renewal of slavery? I've not seen it. I've never seen any, anything from any group, again, that's, uh, you know, that has any credibility that would say, we want to bring slavery back. Uh, is anyone out there uh, advocating the return of, of Jim Crow or segregation? I've, I've not seen it. Anyone has any credibility. Of course, there are, there are uh, you know, people that say these things, uh, but uh, they're not, <laughs> they have no credibility. So why would someone insist that it's important to stand up uh, and in a confirmation hearing say, do you denounce slavery? What kind of question is that in the 21st century? And what Yarborough is saying is he wishes Southerners would stand up and ask, say that. Uh, Senator Kane, instead of asking, saying, yeah, I, I, uh, I fully agree with, I understand the question, and I have to say that I denounce slavery. What, why don't you just say, how is that relevant to my confirmation? What kind of question is that? That's a stupid question. You'd wish people had a backbone. Uh, that is one thing that uh, you know, people did like about Trump. At least he was honest, and he said he would say something like, that's a stupid question. What kind of question is that for the 21st century? 
where has uh, Tom Price said, you know what, I think um, you know, we need to uh, bring back uh, slavery in the South. No one's saying that. It's just stupid. But of course, it's part of this uh, you know, treasury of counterfeit virtue that the North has, or that people have, that think that you can just hammer the South with this, and it's something you can continually bring up, like it's still going on in 2017. Um, and part of this is because of ignorance, part of it is because they're weak. They just won't say, you know, enough is enough. Or why can't Tom Price, why didn't uh, Price respond? Well, you know, Senator, that's a good question. Uh, are you going to ask uh, the uh, anyone that's uh, being, uh, look at confirmation from Massachusetts if they are going to announce their, uh, their ancestors bringing in slaves as part of the slave trade? Are you going to haul uh, the... Uh, president of Yale or Harvard or Brown University before this committee and ask them if they're going to denounce the, um, the involvement of their institutions in the slave trade. When you do that, I'll answer your stupid, irrelevant question. And you wish someone would say that. But of course, that's not what happens. But see, you're, this is where we have a union of incompatible things. If you have a nation... Now, if you don't have a national government with so much power over so many things of they're just you know minutia, then you don't have this problem. But when you have a government that has to micromanage everything in the United States, this is what you get. And this is why you have people agitating for secession in California, or why you have people agitating for secession in Texas when Barack Obama was president. Of course, the real secessionists had recognized this long before. And that's the piece on Wednesday, which was written by the late Thomas Naylor, the small station, uh, small, excuse me, nation manifesto. And he has a wonderful quote from uh, Leopold Kor, who we've, we've talked about on this uh, podcast before. A small state world would not only solve the problems of social brutality and war, it would solve the problems of oppression and tyranny. It would solve all problems arising from power. And essentially that's what we're getting at here. Naylor recognized this. Now Thomas Naylor was a leftist, a far leftist, uh, but he recognized that what we didn't need to have was a union of incompatible things, or more importantly, a mega nation, a mega state of incompatible things. Uh, and that, he said, is why we should push for Vermont secession. So Thomas Naylor was the founder of the Second Vermont Republic, and he con constantly talked about how Vermont could be independent. It could be on its own because size really doesn't matter um, when it comes to states. You know, a small state can exist just as well as a megastate. In fact, probably better. And so this piece on, um, you know, the small nation manifesto talks about American foreign policy being aggressive. And it is. And how that actually causes problems for American citizens. Um how it causes problems for liberty, how these mega nations that we have across the world. He says that uh, they're too big, too powerful, too undemocratic, too environmentally responsible, too intrusive, too insular, and too unresponsive to the needs of individual citizens in small local communities. Well, that's true. This is exactly what's happening in California. It's hap exactly what happened in Texas or when people, other states have talked about secession, Alaska, Hawaii, Vermont. One of the things about the Vermont secession movement that I think would have been better is because there was no baggage with Vermont. Same thing with California, you could argue, that there's, you know, the people there, and of course they've said it, well, we don't have all the baggage of the South. We're just doing this for good reasons. Anytime you're talking of self-determination, it's for a good reason, because they're trying to get away from the center and the abuse that they could suffer under the center. He talks about how these mega nations have not been able to prevent war. Uh, that wars have continued. Now, you could make an argument that they uh, have prevented a world war. And that's an argument that uh, I remember my grandfather used to make when we talk about the United Nations. And he was, uh, you know, World War II uh, veteran. And he said, you know, the thing about the United Nations is it was designed to prevent World War III. And if that's the, if that's the purpose... It's done it. But 
On the other hand, we've had a lot of wars since the United Nations was uh, founded following World War II. So this idea of small nations, of independent republics all over North America, Thomas Jefferson talked about it. He really believed that the West would eventually break free from the East and there would be our sister republics. They would be out there our friends, but we wouldn't have any control over them. An empire of liberty, Jefferson called it. And he didn't mean it that there was going to be some center in Washington, D.C. controlling all these places. That's not liberty. And so we, we have to understand that. That small is beautiful. Small works. That California could exist on its own. That we have aggressive Yankees who want to keep everybody in line in this union. They're going to center this, this nationalism is, is a problem. It's problematic for liberty. It's problematic for uh, self-determination and self-government. It's problematic for all those things. And, of course, uh, this northern hypocrisy, one thing we brought up on the piece on, uh, on Thursday entitled The Southern Yankee, and this is by... Uh, Bernard Thurzum, he's, he's, uh, he runs the, the website Circa 1865, and he always puts in these interesting blocks of text from uh, old books uh, or even sometimes uh, more recent books that outline or, or uh, analyze a particular position. So he says, beyond the New England slave trade, which populated the American South with millions of enslaved Africans, there were many Yankees who moved south before 1861 to engage in agriculture and the holding of slaves. And they had a southern counterpart who learned the Yankees' close-fisted ways. During the war, and after northern bayonets had conquered southern regions, many industrious and profit-minded Yankees came south to try their hand at revolutionizing southern agriculture and labor with experiments at Hilton Head and Louisiana. And he, bring, he has this uh, excerpt from the book Social Relations in Our Southern States by D.R. Hundley. It was written in 1860. And Hunley said, of these, the southern Yankee is without dispute or cavil the meanest. He has nothing whatever to plead an excuse or even extenuation of his, of his selfishness. For all around him is boundless hospitality, and even the very air he breathes excites to warm heartedness, relaxing the closed fist of more northern latitudes into the proverbially open palm of the generous-hearted south. Time was indeed when the southern Yankee had neither a local habitation nor a name. He says, at the present time, the Southern Yankee is quite an institution in the South. The Southern Yankee comes of no particular lineage, but springs from all manner of his forefathers, though in most cases from persons of the middle class. Like his northern brother, the Southern Yankee is deterred by no obstacle whatever from his tireless pursuit of riches. <clears throat> he brings up the fact that, you know, if you look at the book Uncle Tom's Cabin, Simon Legree was a, was a Yankee. He came from the North. And he was more brutal than anyone around him because he was, a, he was a Southern Yankee. That's often lost in that book. Uh, so this is important to note that there even are people in the South that are not real Southerners that don't have with them what we do here. I was, I was actually speaking with uh, Dr. Livingston the other day. We were talking about the piece that um, I wrote last week on Ashley Judd and how, you know, the vulgarity of people in the South today. And he said, simply, Southerners just say, that's not what we do here. And we don't have to drop F-bombs everywhere and say uh, vulgar things in public. This is not what we do here. This is not what we do in the South. That's Yankee. And I think if Southerners started doing that, well, it's just not what we do here. We don't do those things. We have hospitality. We treat people with respect. Uh, we treat women with respect. We treat men with respect. We treat everyone in the South with respect. And I think you would find that uh, person to person all throughout Southern history. Yes, there had been group problems. Yes, there have been issues with people not treating other people with respect. Absolutely. But I don't think the North has any, uh, you know, monopoly on good manners or treating people with respect. 
the the very famous image from 19 I think it's 75 of the race riot in Boston of the white Bostonian smashing over the head of a black Bostonian the the, the U.S. flag. Uh, boy, that's hospitality for you. Uh, I I never saw that in the South. Of course, the South has its own problems and its own history, but person to person, even to this day, I think people find, no matter who you are, that people in the South treat people, even if they're different or... Um, you know, not again, not like them. They treat them with more respect than you would find just about anywhere else in, in the United States, really anywhere else in the world. Southern hospitality has meaning. Manners have meaning. Uh, manners are a way of showing people respect. And when you show people respect, they respond. One thing I've always you know wondered about, and maybe we'll do a piece on this, but you know Southern manners, maybe we'll have a week on Southern manners. but one thing that's interesting to me today is the informality of everything. You know, I don't know many people that I correspond with. I don't know them personally. I've never met them. And I always write emails or, you know, correspondence with Mr., Miss, Mrs., Dr., whoever it is, so-and-so. I don't know these people personally, but it's, it's, it's amazing to me when people don't know me how informal they are. Their, their uh, you know, emails always go with my first name, dear, my first name. Or not even dear, they just put my first name. And I, I don't know these people. The informality of America is very interesting today. Uh, and I think that's something that, you know, manners. If I don't know you, I'm not going to address you by your first name initially. You uh, address someone by their, their title, you know, Mr. or Miss So-and-so. Or Dr. or Mrs. or wh whatever it is. That's how you address them. Now, of course, in our in our world of uh, this gets into whole other issues with, uh, you know, the politically correct left and what they want you to call people or what they think people should be called or what they themselves think they should be called, all these other things that gets into that particular issue. But I think that when you uh, treat people with respect and dignity, they respond better. And that is something that Southern manners did offer. Uh, the Yankee never wanted that. And of course, the Yankee never thinks they're in the wrong. So, the last piece of the week, uh, we have these things. We have incompatible things. We have Californians who don't think that the United States is in their best interest. We have self-righteous uh, Yankees who are always uh, beating on the South and thinking they have some supposed moral high ground. Again, the treasury of counterfeit virtue. Uh, we have uh, this need for decentralization. So, the piece on Friday really gets into how we do this. And it was a talk that I made, actually, in... Atlanta on August 13th about conventions, the voice of the people. And this really is the American tradition to have conventions. Uh, what people don't realize is that conventions have long been the vehicle by which people in the United States have made changes, whether it's from uh, you know, the conventions that took place before uh, the American War for Independence. Essentially, the Continental Congresses were conventions. That's what they were. Uh, and then, of course, after we have uh, the independence of the United States, we had, a, we had conventions. We had the Annapolis Convention. We had the Philadelphia Convention that formed a new constitution. We had conventions to ratify that document. Uh, you had conventions following that. You had, for, you had the very famous, for example, Hartford Convention uh, in 1815, where the North uh, talked about seceding or at least nullifying uh, laws they didn't like. Uh, you had conventions at, uh, in South Carolina to determine nullification of the tariff. You had conventions that led to secession in 1860 and 61. Conventions are the voice of the people. And so if you really want to start talking about what we can do to reform things, you have to start calling conventions. How you change a constitution. You can have conventions to change the U.S. Constitution. Conventions are the vehicle by which all this should happen. And that was what the talk was about, and I'm not going to rehash the talk on this podcast, but that's essentially what I, what I did, is say, look, to move forward, what we need to start doing is calling conventions. California is actually going about this process the wrong way by putting it on a ballot. Okay, what they should do is put it on the ballot and say, let's have a convention. 
to discuss this in an open forum about what we should do. And they don't need the permission of the U.S. government to do this. The Philadelphia Convention did not have the permission of the Articles of Confederation. It was extra legal. But yet it had the voice of the people, so it had weight. Same thing with the conventions that were held across the southern states in 1860 and 61. Some states rejected secession at that point. Others agreed with it. Others followed through. But eventually it was conventions that decided if these states were going to leave the Union. That was the voice of the people. And the argument, well, these people didn't, these conventions did not include uh, everybody. Okay, are you going to say that about Philadelphia in 1787? It didn't include Rhode Island. Women couldn't vote. Blacks couldn't vote in the North at that point, but there were blacks there. So did that convention have the voice of the people? It's a stupid argument, and it should just be called that. You know what? Your argument's stupid. I think what needs to happen sometimes, and it's not, it's not being rude, it's being honest. Like I mentioned with the, with the situation with Tom Price. Just call these people out for what they are. That's a stupid argument. Uh, that question is a stupid question. It's not being rude. Uh, you could say it in a nice way. Uh, Mr. So-and-so, that question is a stupid question. Would you ask that same question of et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? Uh, Mr. So-and-so or Miss So-and-so, that question is stupid uh, because of this, this, and this. Essentially, expose them for being stupid. I think if we started doing that, perhaps, uh, perhaps things would be better off. But the point of that, of that talk was to give people a way, an idea, for how they can uh, have discussions about what to do in the 21st century for these problems. Well, you have conventions. You just call a convention, the voice of the people, and you say, this is what we're going to do. Uh, the, a convention can amend the U.S. Constitution. You can have an Article 5 convention, and you can actually not just amend the Constitution, you could destroy it. You could say, we're starting over, we're scrapping the whole dang thing, and we're starting over. Well, that convention is, uh, I know, well, it's in the Constitution, you can do that. Well, the Philadelphia Convention wasn't in the Articles of Confederation, yet they did it anyways. So, this idea of, uh, you know, that these things, well, if it's not in the Constitution, you can't do it, that's silly. California doesn't need the permission from the rest of the Union to leave if a convention of the people said we're leaving. At that point, the people have spoken. If you don't like the decision, you can leave the state. And that's what people would do, I think. And you had people in the South that didn't agree with the position, and some of them left. So uh, I think that, um, of course, the other thing about that, though, is the, the secession was, uh, was approved by crushing majorities throughout the South. But I think this is something we need to start talking about. How, what are the mechanics? How do you do some of these things? Uh, even if you're talking about nullifying a law, well, you just call a convention and say we're no longer going to agree with this law. You had that happen in the North. So, uh, and we're not going to enforce it here. Well, there you go. A convention, the people have spoken of that state. The people who compose the state have spoken. So I think that's where we need to start looking at these things. Don't work through the legislature. Work through conventions, the real voice of the people. Call your convention and do it that way. And I think if we start doing things that way, things might change. I hope you enjoyed this uh, episode of the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute. Until next time, good day. Good day.